أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله لا يستحيي أن يضرب مثلا ما بعوضة فما فوقها فأما الذين آمنوا فيعلمون أنه الحق من ربهم وأما الذين كفروا فيقولون ماذا أراد الله بهذا مثلا يضل به كثيرا ويهدي به كثيرا وما يضل به إلا الفاسقين إلا الفاسقين الذين ينفضون عهد الله من بعد ميثاقه ويقطعون ما أمر الله به أن يوصل ويفسدون في الأرض أولئك هم الخاسرون رب شحل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله على آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم رمضان كريم to all of you I figure I do a little bit of experimenting uh, instead of collecting an ayah thinking about it throughout the day because I'm going to be reciting Quran throughout the day so as something occurs to me, I figure I just share it with you briefly, inshallah, and let's see how that goes. And I pray that it's of benefit to myself and to all of you. So I you know, started reading Al-Baqarah, and I was thinking about lots of things, and then this ayah just kind of uh, took me into a spiral of questions. Um, it's a pretty scary ayah, so I'll first translate it for you. It's the, it's the second half of this ayah, or the latter part of this ayah, that really, um, you know, it, it's so crucial. Uh, so Allah says that He's not... He's not ashamed to give an example of any kind, even if it's a mosquito or anything even more far-fetched than a mosquito. Um, what Allah is saying is the purpose of revelation is Allah explaining something and whatever it takes to explain. So nothing is, so, so long as for an educator, you know, for an educator, it's not about, um, you know, if I, if I water down the concept or if I explain a concept in a way that seems childish to some or unsophisticated to some, he's not interested in impressing you. You know, like when you're when you're studying the Quran and you find that it's not using if you're reading a translation, it's not using complex vocabulary. Right. If you're reading a book like an advanced book in literature um, or you're reading something like a like a high end journal or article or something like that, they're going to use high end, sophisticated, abstract terms and vocabulary. But the Quran is not using specialized vocabulary. Though, and even when Allah is giving examples, he's very giving very basic examples. So. For people that are so impressed with themselves, they feel like it's unsophisticated, right? It's, it's beneath them to read something so basic because they're so super advanced, which is kind of, a, a, you know, a delusion that they have, right? A person can have that delusion that they're so far above the more basic, you know, um, uh, almost, you know, peasant language, the language of the ancient Arabs. These people weren't advanced. They were just living in the desert. So Allah is speaking at their low level, you know? And Allah says he's not embarrassed to, sh to give whatever example to get the point across. And in fact, when you study Quran deeply, you realize it's very sophisticated, more sophisticated than anything else you'll ever read. But anyway, that's not the, the, the point I wanted to get to. He says, As for those who've uh, ac accepted the faith, um, they know then that this is in fact the truth that comes from their master. Meaning, they realize the value of it. And they realize it's from Allah, so there's something rich and deep here. Even though the example is easy to understand, the lessons in it may be profound and very, very deep. So we don't underestimate what he's saying. Um, and as for those who disbelieve, and as for those who've disbelieved, or they've been in denial, then they'll turn around and say, What does what Allah mean by giving this example? What's, what's the point of giving this example? You couldn't find something else to talk about? Or we, he couldn't explain it another way? This is the scary part. This is the part that made me uh, make this broadcast. He says, He misguides by means of it, meaning the example, meaning the Quran, meaning the explanation God is giving. By using that example, by using that explanation, Allah allows many to be misguided. And by means of it, He guides many. So now it's like the Quran is being described like a double-edged sword. Like it could work for you and against you. You know? Um, so if that's the case, if it could work for you and against you, then we want it to work for us. And we want Allah to guide us, counsel us, give us that mo'idha that I talked about in the intro session. 
how are we going to make sure that we we get the right thing out of the Quran? We don't get the, the wrong thing out of the Quran because Allah is saying He will allow both to happen, and so He gives a qualification at the end. Wa ma yudillu bihi illa al-fasiqin. This will take five minutes, I think. And He doesn't misguide anybody except those that are inherently corrupt, and their corruption is starting to come out. Fisk actually means like it comes from the Arabic word. I translate it as corruption, but it's actually a fruit that's gone bad, and it like the the the, the the melted or the goo inside of it that's disgusting that tells you it's it's gone bad it starts coming out and you're already seeing signs that this fruit has gone bad you, you don't want to bite into that so anyway that's the word used to describe a corrupt person meaning their corruption isn't just hidden anymore it's starting to come out the smell of it the ooze of it the same way the cor the, the evil of this person is starting to show uh, and those are the people that Allah does not allow to be guided but he didn't stop there this is why I said 26 and 27 so who are these corrupt people what is their description? Their description is in the next ayah. So this is important because then Allah is saying He won't allow anybody to be misguided except people that have corruption. And that corruption is made up of three descriptions. And these are the three descriptions in ayah number 27. He says, uh, number one, description number one, Those who cut or sever the promise of Allah, they violate and, and sever the promise of Allah even after it had been made binding. So this is talking about our connection to Allah. We've made a promise to Him that He's our master. It's, a, it's, a, it's something deep inside of our souls that we know that He's our master. And we've accepted this. And after knowing that He's our Rabb and we are going to go and back, back and meet Him, somewhere in, our, in the depth of our hearts, we've decided that we will ignore that commitment a person decides that they are going to abandon that commitment and they're not, they're not going to uphold that promise that he is my, my master, my nourisher, my sustainer. I have to be grateful to him. I have to be loyal to him. I have to be, be obedient to him. When I mess up, I have to turn back to him and ask him for forgiveness. They have let that go. That's the first thing. They've severed their connection to Allah, to the word of Allah. They've basically, this is the, the first sign of corruption to Allah is people that have abandoned him, but that's not enough. So people that have cut himself off from him and his word. Okay, that's, that's part one of corruption. What's part two? وَيَقْدَعُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَن يُوصَلَ And they cut apart what Allah commanded to keep joined. And this, many scholars talk about this being like family ties. So what he's saying is when, when we become, we, we, or, or, you know, ties of humanity, brotherhood, um, ties that, that of civility between people, people that have let Allah go, and let his word go somewhere inside them, even if it shows on the outside. Because the, 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 uh, the incredible thing about this ayah, the reason, again, I shared this with you, is because in the previous ayah, it's not people who don't even read the Qur'an. It's people that read the Qur'an, and they get two different reactions, right? They say, what, what does he mean by this example? And Allah says, he guides many, he, he misguides many, he guides many. So he, he, he mentioned both things. So it's not people that have nothing to do with the religion. On the outside, they might actually have something to do with the religion. But one of those people, and Allah, I pray He doesn't make me from them, He doesn't make you from them. They're actually corrupt to Him. Forget by anybody else's judgment, this is Allah's own judgment. This person is corrupt, even if they're engaging with the Qur'an, they'll get nothing out of it. Number one, they've actually abandoned Allah, and the reason they're reading the Qur'an is something else. Number two, even if they read Allah's word, they're finding in it a way to cut family ties. They're, they're dismissing the actual meaning, even if deep down they know what it means, and they're using it in a way, or, or abandoning the actual meaning, in a way that justifies cutting family ties, uh, you know, oppressing uh, other human beings, engaging in injustice. So the first problem was, um, you know, cutting off Allah, and the second problem is now cutting off people, like doing wrong by people in your personal life. And what does he say is the third? It's actually this like, logical progression, he says, and this is the last one, he says, وَيُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ And they, they, they cause corruption in the land, meaning they cause political corruption, economic corruption, social corruption, macro scale, the kind of corruption that makes it to the news, the kind of corruption that a nation talks about, we have to deal with corruption in our society at every level, right? That big scale corruption. So what is Allah telling us? Corruption starts as a spiritual thing, and it moves to a family thing, and then it becomes a societal thing. How powerful. And those are the people Allah refuses to guide. That create, they, they think that their evil is limited to them, their abandonment of Allah and His Word, and their engaging in wrongdoing in their personal life is actually the root cause 
of tremendous corruption at a large scale, at a macro scale in society. Those are the ultimate losers. May Allah Azza wa Jalla not make us from them. So, if we're if you, you, now we got to reverse this, and so inshallah, that'll, that's what I'll conclude with. I have to think about how I can't be prom- breaking my promise I made with Allah. I don't become from Alladina Yanquduna Ahdullahi Min Badi Mithaqihi. That's the first description of the Fasiqeen, those who cut the promise of Allah after they made it. What promise have I made to Allah? What did I promise Him I'll do with my life? What did I promise him I'll do if he gives me the blessing of rizq, the blessing of health? You know, if he answers my prayers, if he if he takes care of my needs, if he even take beyond my needs, he takes care of my wants. What am I going to do in return? You know, and even if he if he puts me through a trial, how will I act? What commitment have I made to him? And how am I living? Am I am I meeting that promise, or have I abandoned that promise? And then on t- the, the the second step is: Am I cutting ties that weren't supposed to be cut? وَيَقْطَعُونَ مَا أَمْرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَنْ يُصَلَى Am I, am I uh, uh, abandoning family? Am I violating somebody's rights? Am I, you know, uh, um, not giving somebody their due just because I, my, my feelings are stopping me from what Allah is saying? If I, if I put my feelings above Allah's words, I have to ask myself this question. You have to ask yourself this question. And then I have to think about what am I doing that everything I do has an effect not just on me, on the people around me, on the kids that are watching, on the, uh, you know, on my neighborhood. Every every action has an impact. The way that I talk, the words that I say. Like if you're standing at a restaurant and you just, you know, you're frustrated or something, or you're in line somewhere and you're frustrated and you use a bad word, right? If you use that bad word, even a child hears it and it becomes just 0.001% more normal to that child to hear that bad word. I just spread corruption. Like I had, a, I had a negative effect on the world around me, right? So really making myself think about how I don't become from these three categories or I have nothing to do with them. Because if I'm from these categories, then I'm heading down a path where Allah closes the doors of His guidance for people. So I, you know, may Allah not make us from them. And this is of course describing the worst of the people. So we don't become, want to become paranoid about ourselves either. But it's certainly something we, you and I have to watch out for. So I pray this Ramadan we become, uh, you know, we, we take good cause to reflect on ourselves and what we're doing with our lives and really restore our promise made with our Rabb. Barakallahu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.